Okay, good morning. And welcome to June. June is busting out all over, right? Uh, my name is Evan Wiener, and uh, we're going to go back 109 years. And uh, you would say, why 109 years ago? What happened 109 years ago? But what happened in those days, in 1915, did impact you because it impacted your parents, your grandparents, your uncles, your aunts, your great uncles, and uh, your great aunts, and maybe old enough um, sisters and brothers. Uh, a lot of things that happened in 1915 uh, and 109 years later, we're still talking about some of the same issues. Like, uh, well, war, the Great War started. The Ku Klux Klan revival in 1915, all because of this movie. It's called The Klansman, or Birth of a Nation, and that started the Ku Klux Klan second wave. Then, The Great White Hope. Jack Johnson was the uh, heavyweight champion of the world the racism in the United States, who's going to be the white guy to knock off Jack Johnson, unforgivable, no, unforgivable blackness, as W.E.B. Dubois uh, <coughs> said about Jack Johnson. Uh, free speech, Emma Goldman. Anybody ever hear of Emma Goldman? Sure. You have, okay. She's arrested. Why is she arrested? She's talking about birth control. That's an issue in 2024 in Louisiana. Uh, the Republicans in Louisiana this year in their legislature want to outlaw contraception in Louisiana. 109 years ago we talked about that. Uh, the National Birth Control League started. Women want to vote. And at this point there are 10 states that allow women to vote. Uh, and uh, also, Statue of Liberty, get out. Don't come. Don't come at all. We don't want any part of you. Let's get the immigrants out of the United States. Uh, Archduke Ferdinand is assassinated in June of 1914, and that leads to the Great War. Franz Ferdinand was the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and his wife, they're both assassinated by a gunman during a drive through Sarajevo, June 28, 1914. Ferdinand had ignored the warnings. Hey, don't go, don't go, stay home. They, those people in Sarajevo, there are some people there who absolutely hate you. They absolutely hate you. They hate the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Why? Because they absorbed Serbia in 1908. Uh, and he's going there. It's uh, Serbian National Day. And his wife Sophie says, hey, look, France. Let's go somewhere else. Yeah, we don't have to go to Sarajevo. I hear that Sarajevo's nice in the winter, so maybe we'll go back at some other point. Fred says, nah, I'm going to go, I'm going to go. Well, he goes, and he gets killed. Uh, the killing is, is traced to a Serbian group uh, in the Balkans who were upset with the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, World War I, which was not known as World War I when it started a month later on July 28, 1914, uh, Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia and all of the uh, peace treaties in Europe basically fall apart. Uh, after that, there were three, well, you know, there was uh, Austria-Hungary, uh, Prussia and Germany and Russia. Those were the three major powers and things fell apart after uh, Archduke Ferdinand's assassination. So within a week, Russia, Belgium, France, Great Britain and Serbia declared war on Austria-Hungary and Germany and with that World War I starts. The Austria-Hungary Empire also attacked Serbia. Uh, Germany supported Austria-Hungary uh, and uh, Russia sided with its traditional ally, Serbia. Meanwhile, that's Woodrow Wilson. Uh, Woodrow Wilson is sitting this one out. Uh, America is watching, but America has, there's no reason for America to get involved in this fight at this point. Um, they're just watching. Wilson is trying to keep neutral. He wants to keep trade going <coughs> with both sides of the war. And uh, so he's satisfied with this by August 4th, 1914, that the United States would be impartial in thought as well as in action. Money talks, and he doesn't want to lose the money quite yet. 
On February 4th, 1915, the Germans declare a submarine blockade of Britain and a ship approaching. The British coast is to be considered a legitimate target. On March 11th, uh, in an attempt to starve the enemy into submission, uh, Britain announces a blockade of all German ports. Neutral ships are uh, heading for Germany, uh, are going to be stopped, escorted uh, to Allied ports and detained. Uh, I spoke on cruise ships up until a couple years ago. Uh, actually, now it's five years ago. And um, what basically I was doing on the ships was talking. And uh, there was a Holland America one day. And uh, I'm on Holland America, and I'm talking. And uh, there was another lecturer on the ship, and he was from Holland America. And he was talking about the history of Holland America. And he was saying that uh, Holland America, during the 19-teens, carried munitions during the war. They were also taking uh, what would become American immigrants. They were taking people from Europe and bringing them over to America. And that was infuriating some people in America, but they were bringing the immigrants over. He said the ships were fair game because they did have munitions against Germany. So he said, we understood that we were in a war zone and we understood the risks of being in a war zone. Um, so Holland America did what it did and uh, some of its ships in the 19 teens were converted uh, into uh, fighting uh, ships uh, for the Allies. Uh, on March 11th, uh, the British steamship RMS Falaba becomes the first passenger ship to be sunk by German U-boats. Uh, the U-boat uh, U-28, 104 people are lost to sea, including one American passenger. Zeppelin raids. Zeppelin. The Zeppelins start during World War I. Uh, on January 19th, 1915, Germany began Zeppelin raids in England. Uh, the Zeppelins were able to fly uh, at a higher attitude than the defender's planes. They had been developed by the Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin, and they were used in the German military since 1909. Uh, the Germans targeted the coastal towns of Yarmouth and King's Lynn in January before moving on to attack London in May. It took a while, but the British pilots were uh, able to figure out how to defeat the Zeppelins. Chemical warfare. Germans introduced chemicals, mustard gas, uh, into the trenches. And this kills a lot of people, and it kills a lot of people rather quickly. Uh, trench warfare was the scene uh, of using poison gas. A non-lethal type of gas was used by the Germans in late 1914, but a more damaging kind was put onto the Eastern Front in January in what is now Poland at uh, Bolomov on the Eastern Front in the fighting between the Germans and the Russians. It froze. Uh, the Germans developed chlorine gas that would be used at Ypres in April, and uh, it dispersed in the air. And uh, all it did was catch the artillery fire, and it would move in the air. Uh, on April 22nd, the Second Battle of Ypres begins. At 5 o'clock in the afternoon, German soldiers open the valves and release almost 200 tons of chlorine gas across a 2.5-mile area. It was heavier than air uh, and would rely on wind direction to blow the gas toward the French trenches. 6,000 Allied troops died within 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Canadian reinforcements uh, improvised uh, by covering their faces with urine-soaked scarves. The British Expeditionary Force was able to counter the use of gas with their own variants. Remember this guy, Winston Churchill? He was a screw-up in World War I. He was an absolute screw-up. But he was First Lord of the Admiralty Winston Churchill back in 1914. Many in Britain, notably uh, Churchill, believed that knocking the Ottomans out of the war would undermine the Germans. Um, they theorized that as a result of this attack, uh, Britain and France would be able to help their weakened partner, Russia, that the Suez Canal and Britain's Middle East oil interests. We're talking about oil interests. Oil lobby back in 1915. Uh, would be secured and that undecided uh, Balkan states, including Bulgaria and Greece, would join the Allied side. 
But it was based on the mistaken belief that the Ottomans were weak and could be easily overcome. The Dardanelles, that's a place, a theater in the World War I. Uh, February 19th, the British and French forces uh, launch a naval attack against Turkish forces in the Dardanelles. The Allied forces aimed at controlling uh, or take control of a key strait that connected Europe to Asia. The campaign was not successful and was a huge loss for the Allied forces. Hundreds of men perished on both sides, and the Allies lost several important battleships to mines in the water. The Allies had hoped that a victory would garner more support for their side uh, from some of the states that were neutral, Bulgaria, and Greece, and Romania. Contained by the Ottoman defenders, a new assault began on August the 6th. Each fresh attempt was defeated, and by mid-January 1916, all the Allied troops had been evacuated, and the attack on the Dardanelles was abandoned. Um, you've heard the poem in Flanders Field. The poem in Flanders Field. Uh, in Flanders Field was uh, by a Canadian physician, Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, and he was inspired to write uh, it on May 3rd after presiding over the funeral of a friend and a fellow soldier, Lieutenant Alexis Himmler, who died in the Second Battle of uh, Ypres. Uh, according to legend, fellow soldiers retrieved the poem by McCray, and they claimed, or he claimed, he was dissatisfied with the work and he threw it out. In Flanders Field, it was first published on December 8th in a London magazine called Punch, Flanders Field is a common English name of World War I battlefields in Belgium and France. Well, the Americans are drawn into the war. Not quite yet, but they're drawn into the war with the sinking of the Lusitania. Uh, Germany declared the water surrounding the British Isles to be a war zone, and German U-boats uh, sunk several commercial and passenger vehicles, uh, including some U.S. ships. Widespread protest uh, over the sinking by uh, the U-boat uh, of the British Ocean Liner uh, Lusitania, traveling from New York to Liverpool. It was on the New York to Liverpool, Liverpool to New York route uh, in England, Liverpool. Hundreds of American passengers uh, were on board on May 7th and then helped turn the tide of American opinion against Germany. William Jennings Bryan was the Secretary of State at the time. And he was worried about uh, all these ships going through the war zones. So William Jennings Bryan is telling Woodrow Wilson, we can't do this. On June 9th, uh, the United States Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, uh, resigned. It's due to his concern over President Woodrow Wilson's handling of the crisis generated by a German submarine sinking of the British passenger liner Lusitania the previous month, 1,201 people including 121, uh, 128 Americans had died. When the German government responded by justifying their Navy's actions on the basis that the Lusitania was carrying munitions, Wilson himself penned a strongly worded note uh, insisting that the sinking had been an illegal action and demanded that Germany cease unrestricted submarine warfare against unarmed merchant ships. Uh, this guy, Lansing, Robert Lansing, replaces William Jennings Bryan, uh, objecting to the strong position taken by Wilson in the second Lusitania note and believing it could have been taken as a precursor for war and declaration of war. Bryan said, I'm out of here. And uh, he doesn't sign it, and he quits on June the 9th. Bryan's resignation marked a significant turning point as the Lusitania crisis uh, had uh, convinced his successor, Robert Lansing, that the U.S. could not remain neutral forever. And another ship goes down, the SS Arabic. Uh, on August 19th, the, a German submarine sunk the British Ocean Liner and claimed self-defense. The event further strained relations between the United States and Germany. President Wilson warned Germany that if it was determined they sunk the ship without cause. The United States may cut off diplomatic relations and enter the war. Germany would cave, and in September, they no longer sink passenger ships without warning. Satisfied for the moment, Wilson chose not to declare war in Germany, despite being encouraged otherwise by some of his cabinet members. 
birth of a nation comes out. And birth of a nation would lead to the second iteration of the Ku Klux Klan. It's a movie by D.W. Griffin. And it is a movie that Woodrow Wilson thoroughly embraced. January 1st, the actor, the filmmaker, D.W. Griffin, previews his new movie. It's called The Klansman at the Loring Opera House at 3745 7th Street in Riverside, California, east of Los Angeles. Based on Thomas Dixon's 1905 novel, The Klansman, Birth of a Nation begins as the South marches into battle to defend its way of life uh, against the North, and the North wants to get rid of that life. Second half of the film finds the defeated South at the mercy of Northern carpetbaggers, vengeful Union politicians, and easily manipulated free slaves. All that remains of the South's honor during Reconstruction is its virtuous women. Once this honor is threatened by a renegade Negro, the Ku Klux Klan is born, imposing order on chaos and releasing Southern whites from under the heel of blacks. Birth of a Nation. Well, there's a poster for it. Uh, it has uh, $5 a seat. $5 a seat, which is today about uh, $150 a seat, somewhere around there, uh, to see that movie. Birth of a Nation drew harsh criticism uh, for honoring the Klan's historic role as a force of opposition during the Reconstruction era, uh, idea that black people could not be successfully uh, integrated into white society. Uh, the National Association for the Advancement of the Colored People uh, published a pamphlet denouncing the film, referring to it as Three Miles of Film. Birth of a Nation was officially released on February 8th in just over three hours. D.W. Griffith's uh, controversial epic film depicted the Ku Klux Klan as the valiant saviors of the post-war South ravaged by northern carpetbaggers and a morally freed black people. Film is an instant blockbuster. Most white audiences love the film, and they're paying $2. Two dollars, which was an incredibly high charge in those days, sixty dollars today in today's money to see it. Do you spend sixty bucks for a movie today? Probably not, but they did. Uh, and it's the revival of the Klan, and that's a lynching back uh, in uh, the mid 19 teens. On February 18th, upon viewing the movie *Birth of a Nation* at a special White House screening, President Woodrow Wilson reportedly remarked. It's like writing history with lightning. My only regret is that it is so terribly true. Wilson believed in the lost cause, and on April 11, 1913, he segregated the post office, which was home to over 60% of federal jobs at the time and employed many black workers. And Woodrow Wilson's words are in the film. They are in the film, and I will read it right here. It says, the white man were roused by a mere instinct of self-preservation until at last there had sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a venerable empire of the South to protect the Southern country. Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States, endorsing a movie about racism. Uh, and that was on the title card. Uh, this is uh, Stone Mountain, Georgia. And behind me at Stone Mountain, Georgia, which is north of Atlanta, is this uh, carving into the rock, one of uh, the rocks at Stone Mountain. And on it is uh, Jefferson Davis, who was the president of the Confederacy, along with Robert E. Lee, who is the general, and also Stonewall Jackson. And it's an honor to the South. The, uh, the uh, interesting thing about Stone Mountain, Georgia, it is a minority majority town, which means that uh, African Americans make up the bulk of the population there. The popularity of the birth of the nation, and specifically its showing in Atlanta, Georgia, provided the major impetus for the reemergence of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, Alabama born William J. Simmons held a ceremony at the top of uh, Stone Mountain on November 25th to announce the refounding of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, the venerable family, which owned the mountain, allowed Simmons in his version of the Klan to use the mountain for its rituals. And this is the film 
and that's a still from the film. On opening night, December 6th, Simmons and his fellow Klansmen, uh, dressed in white sheets and Confederate uniforms, paraded down Peachtree Street with hooded horses, firing rifle salutes in front of the theater. Uh, this is uh, Salt Lake City. And when you went to the movies to see Birth of a Nation, the ushers dressed as Klansmen. They were dressed in their hoods, they were dressed in their robes. Uh, this horse is wearing a hood and a robe. It says, Birth of a Nation. That's what the Ku Klux Klan was selling and the nation was buying it. The effect was powerful. Screenings and uh, e e echo the display around the country as movie ushers uh, put on white uniforms. Klansmen handed out KKK literature before and after the screenings. Uh, Birth of a Nation was the uh, longest and most profitable film produced and the most artistically advanced film of the era. The film grossed somewhere between 13 and 18 million dollars, which would be 300 to 400 million dollars today uh, in American money. Uh, looking for the Great White Hope. Jack Johnson was the heavyweight champion of the world, the boxing world, and boxing was important. It was baseball, boxing, horse racing back in those days. And American, at least American whites, absolutely hated Jack Johnson, particularly politicians. On April 5th, Jack Johnson lost his heavyweight uh, boxing title to Jess Willard, who was a working cowboy from Kansas who started boxing when he was 27 years old. A crowd of about 25,000 people at the Oriental Park racetrack in Havana, Cuba, watched. Uh, Johnson was knocked out in the 26th round. Uh, it was a 45 round fight. Today, fights are just 12 rounds. 45 rounds, three minutes each, which comes out to what? 135 minutes, which means two hours and 15 minutes of boxing. Um, so, 45 rounds, uh, and uh, it goes 26. And it was hot in Havana. Late 1914, two promoters, Jack Curley and Harry Frisay, uh, began uh, working to arrange a title fight between Johnson and Jess Willard. The fight was set for 45 rounds on Monday, April 5th, 1915. Willard was given little chance to win, but he was younger than Johnson, and unlike Johnson, he took his training seriously. After 26 rounds in the 105 degree temperature, Johnson was exhausted. A straight right from Willard took him by surprise. He slid to the canvas. Uh, Willard was now the heavyweight champion of the world, and that was to the relief of most people in the United States. The Great White Hope, they had been looking for the Great White Hope for a long time, and the Great White Hope would become the title of a Broadway play many years later. Jack Johnson was uh, boxing's first heavyweight champion. He won the title in 1908. Uh, the first black heavyweight champion, and he went on to outrage the public with his refusal to abide by the expectation of both polite society and a racist America which regarded black people as second-class citizens. But he did whatever he wanted. He flaunted his wealth and openly carried on with white women, even marrying more than one. There were repeated campaigns to find the great white hope to set things right. Even Congress gets into the act. Uh, not sure if this was specifically aimed at Jack Johnson, but it is kind of aimed at uh, people like Jack Johnson. One of the landmarks of the Progressive Era, which was from 1890 on in the United States, was the White Slave Traffic Act, better known as the Mann Act for its uh, author, the Illinois Congressman James Robert Mann. The Mann Act was passed on June 25, 1910. The Mann Act made it a crime to transport women across state lines for the purpose of prostitution or debauchery or any other immoral purpose. And I lived in New York and I dated somebody in New Jersey, so technically I probably could have been held on the Mann Act with the intent that it had. Uh, while designed to combat forced prostitution, the law was so broadly worded that the courts held it to criminalize many forms of consensual sexual activity, and soon it was being used as a tool for political persecution of Jack Johnson and others, as well as a tool for blackmail. 
and Jack Johnson is allegedly arrested for breaking the Mann Act. Um, Johnson was one of the Law's first victims. When he beat a white boxer, undefeated heavyweight champion, James Jeffries, in a highly publicized bout in 1910, um, he triggered race riots. It also made law enforcement take a closer look at Johnson, who was known for his flamboyant behavior and lavish spending. The behavior had long rankled those who thought an African-American man should know his place in staying it. On October 18, 1912, prosecutors got their chance to enforce the Mann Act when Lucille Cameron, uh, her mother, accused Johnson of kidnapping her daughter and transporting her across state lines. Though Johnson was uh, in a consensual relationship with the 18-year-old Cameron, who was a prostitute, prosecutors used the accusation as a pretext. When the Chicago police arrested him for kidnapping, <coughs> Federal prosecutors assembled a grand jury to investigate his relationships with white women. That is Jack Johnson, that is Lucille Cameron. Um, there was just one problem. Cameron was in love with Johnson and refused to say anything to incriminate him. And prosecutors found out that Cameron was a prostitute, which underlined her credibility as a witness. They dropped the case temporarily, but not before the public caught wind of it. On December 4th, Johnson and Cameron were married, an act that absolutely outraged the public. Prosecutors soon hit on another excuse to enforce the act. Johnson's past relationship with Belle Schreiber, a white prostitute who agreed to testify against him. Schreiber's testimony, along with Johnson's recent marriage to Cameron, convinced the jury that he had run afoul of the Mann Act and had taken her across state lines for immoral purposes. And all white jury uh, convicted him and he was sentenced to a year and a day in prison. Around the United States, lawmakers introduced bills to ban marriage between black and white people in multiple states. None of them passed. However, it illustrated how preoccupied the nation was with Johnson's interracial relationship and his crime. Uh, this is a representative from Georgia by the name of Seaborn Roddenberry. And uh, in December 1912 and in January 1913, the representative uh, Roddenberry, a Democrat from Georgia, introduced a proposal in the House of Representatives to insert a prohibition of interracial marriage into the U.S. Constitution, make it unconstitutional for a man who might be black or white and a woman who might be black and white ever to get married. He said inter, uh, intermarriage between Negroes and persons of color and Caucasians within the United States is forever prohibited. The proposal went nowhere. In 1913, 30 out of the then 48 states enforced interracial marriage laws as legally blacks and whites could not marry in those locales. Only Connecticut, New Hampshire, New York, New Jersey, Vermont, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Alaska, Hawaii, and Washington, D.C. never enacted that. Uh, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz in 1940 got married in Connecticut. It was legal for them to get married in Connecticut. They were an interracial couple. Alan Bell, pending conviction, Johnson fled the country disguised as a member of a black baseball team to Canada with Cameron. He continued to fight overseas, including two defenses of his world title in Paris. The next great white hope. Uh, desperate for cash, Jackson accepted an offer from promoter Jack uh, Curley for $30,000, about $911,000 today. Today he would command $100 million, $200, $300 million for a fight to fight another white hope. Uh, if Curley could guarantee the money and arrange the contest close enough to the United States to attract ticket buyers, they had a deal. Mexico was an option, but Johnson said no to Mexico. The reason why? He was afraid that the Texas Rangers were going to kidnap him and bring him back to the United States. Havana was fine. It's an island, Cuba, and you know, whereas Mexico is part of the land. When Curley uh, met Johnson, the champ was in need of a big payday, and only a legitimate challenger could guarantee that. They found him in Jess Willard. Willard was six foot six, weighed 250 pounds, had an 84-inch reach, 
His contract was for $5,000, about $152,000 today, and a third of the motion picture rights if it went into the movies. The White Hope had arrived. In the 26th round, Willard delivered a lightning quick straight right that landed on the, the point of Johnson's chin, and the champ went down, slumped to the canvas, rolled up on his back, and was counted out. The Great White Hope era was over. Johnson accepted the, the defeat by uh, stating, I've been beaten fairly by youth and condition. Leo Frank, the lynching of Leo Frank, which became a made-for-TV movie years later and also spurred a few other things. August 25th, 1913, Leo Frank was convicted of murdering Mary Fagan. 13-year-old employee of the Atlanta pencil factory that Frank managed. After his death sentence was commuted by George's governor, uh, a mob stormed the prison where Frank was being held and lynched him. Frank became the only known Jew lynched in American history. Uh, and that is Mary Fagan, who was 13 years old. Little Mary Fagan as she became known, left home on the morning of April 26, 1913 to pick up her wages at the pencil factory and view the Confederate Day Parade. She never returned home. Oh, child labor in those days. No problem. Child labor was accepted and accepted practice back in those days. The next night, the factory uh, night watchman uh, found her sawdust-covered body in the basement floor. When Frank, who had just completed a term as the uh, president of an Atlanta B'nai B'rith chapter, was asked to view the body, became agitated, confirmed uh, personally paying Mary tier wages, uh, and, uh, but wouldn't say where she went next. Frank was the last to see Mary alive and became the prime suspect. And there was Leo Frank in jail. Uh, George's solicitor general, you, Dorsey, saw the grand jury indictment against Frank. Rumors circulated that Mary had been sexually assaulted. Uh, factory employees uh, offered uh, apparently false testimony that Frank made sexual advances to them. Uh, the madam of a house of ill repute claimed that Frank had phoned her several times seeking a room for himself and a young girl. Uh, for this grand jury, uh, Dorsey, the uh, local solicitor painted Leo Frank as a sexual pervert uh, who is both homosexual and preyed on young girls. What he did not tell the grand jury, it is amazing when you get to a jury trial or grand jury, you can hide things. You don't have to tell uh, everything going on and the jury is asked to just listen to the evidence and not think about, oh, something else might be going on. I've covered too many, uh, over the years, too many defense lawyers who have lied to me as a reporter. Uh, defense lawyers, AGs, district attorneys uh, have some problems with the truth, at least in my experiences. Uh, and apparently this happened here. Uh, what he did not tell the grand jury was that the janitor at the factory, Jim Conley, had been arrested two days after Frank when he was seen washing blood off his shirt. Conley then admitted writing two notes found by Mary Fagan's body. But they didn't bother telling because the guy wanted to look good, I suppose, the district attorney, and that goes on and on to this day. At the time when the cult of the Southern chivalry was making it a hanging crime for African American males to have sexual contact with the flower of white womanhood, these accusations against Frank, a northern born college educated Jew, proved equally inflammatory. And there is Leo Frank. Even after Frank's housekeeper placed him at a home, or at home, uh, having lunch at the time of the murder, and despite gross inconsistencies of Conley's story, both the grand jury and the trial jury chose to believe Conley. Uh, this is a rare instance where a southern black man's testimony was being used to convict a white man. Uh, on, in August 1913, the jury found Frank guilty in less than four hours with crowds outside the courtroom shouting, hang the Jew, hang the Jew. Uh, the police assumed, and as the author of these notes, Conley was the murderer, but Conley claimed after apparent coaching from the solicitor, Dorsey, uh, that Leo Frank had confessed murdering Mary in the lathe room 
and paid Conley to pen the notes and help him move Mary's body to the basement. <coughs> this is the governor of Georgia at the time, Frank Slayton. And Frank Slayton is taking a close look at the case. On June 21st, the governor, after a 12-day review of the evidence and letters recommending uh, that uh, the sentence be commuted from the trial judge and a private investigator who had worked for you, Dorsey. Dorsey is a bad guy in all this. Uh, commuted Frank's sentence to life imprisonment. Uh, that night, state police kept a protesting crowd of 5,000 from the governor's mansion. The decision ruined Slayton's career. And there is Leo Frank hanging from a tree. Soon after the uh, commuting the sentence on August 17th, a group of 25 men, described by peers as sober, intelligent, of established good name and character, stormed the prison hospital where Leo Frank was recovering from having his throat slashed by a fellow inmate. They kidnapped Frank, drove him more than 100 miles to uh, Mary Fagan's hometown of Marianne, Georgia, and they hanged him from a tree. And that was it. Social uh, justice was done. The lynching of Leo Frank, and there is Leo Frank hanging from a tree. Town's folks were proudly photographed beneath Frank's swinging corpse. On August 19th, the New York Times reported that the vast majority of Cobb County, Georgia residents uh, believed that Frank had received his just desserts and that the lynch mob had simply stepped in to uphold the law after Governor Slayton arbitrarily set it aside. Emma Goldman and free speech. Let's take free speech away from Emma Goldman. Well, she was a known uh, anarchist, probably a socialist and a communist. In the late 1890s, Emma Goldman worked as a nurse and a midwife among poor immigrants in New York City's Lower East Side, and she campaigned for legalized birth control. She did not do abortions. She did not do back alley abortions. All she talked about was legalized birth control. She believed that contraception was essential to a woman's social, sexual, and economic freedom. Uh, Emma Goldman was arrested for lecturing and distributing material in support of birth control. Uh, she was an early member, of, uh, early mentor of uh, Margaret Sanger, who founded Planned Parenthood. She was arrested in 1915 for speaking out against birth control. Um, Goldman was asked to perform abortions, but refused because she saw that it would do nothing to help tackle the social problem. She fought for birth control as a positive alternative. And that is Margaret Sanger. Uh, the National Birth Control League, a United States organization, was founded in March by Mary Dennett, uh, uh, Jesse Ashley, Clara Gruning, Stillman, and Sanger. It was America's first birth control organization. Sanger came up with the name birth control. Uh, the goal of the group was to improve uh, birth control education and to change laws that prohibited access to information about how to prevent contraception. It published birth control literature, drafted federal legislation uh, concepts, held conferences in New York City in its New York City headquarters. Sanger embarked on successful cross-country speaking tour, which put her in to the leadership of the U.S. birth control movement. Women were not taking back seats anymore. No more. Women did not want to be second-class citizens. They wanted their rights, rights to control their body, rights to vote. They were in the forefront. And a lot of people couldn't deal with the fact that women stood up and said, hey, we want this, we want equal rights. Women like Alice Paul. Alice Paul felt that being polite and asking sweetly for the right to vote was not getting women anywhere. And that radical tactics uh, were necessary. For a woman, that might mean standing on the street corner, holding a sign, or speaking from a stage. Uh, those were considered radical acts. While in prison in England, she learned that hunger strikes were an effective way to get attention and bring sympathy to the cause. Uh, she returned to the United States in 1910, turned her attention to the American suffrage movement after the deaths of Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1902 and Susan B. Anthony in 1906, 
uh, the movement was uh, languishing, uh, lacking focus, uh, basically saying, let's see what we can do on the state level. Alice Paul said, no, we've got to get a federal constitutional amendment passed allowing the right for all women to vote. 1911, she led Philadelphia's first street corner campaign for the right to vote. Night after night, for two months, speaking from a horse-drawn cart, Paul and other suffragettes uh, made their case to the crowds that sometime numbered in the 100s. At her side, Lucy Burns, who was from Brooklyn. She met her in a London police station after they were protesting in England for the right for women to vote in England. And there is Lucy Burns. Paul and Burns uh, offered to take over the National Women's Suffragette uh, Suffrage uh, Association's Congressional Committee in Washington, D.C., um, which was tasked with uh, promoting a constitutional amendment. Paul topped her action list with a parade and uh, spectacle of the sort that had never been seen in Washington, D.C. And this is the program of the Women's Suffrage uh, Parade, which would be on March 3rd, 1913, the day before Woodrow Wilson would become president of the United States. Um, so, there are 8,000 marchers, mostly women, and they're all wearing white. Uh, and they have colorful caps and capes, and they have mounted brigades, and they have floats that they release on Pennsylvania Avenue. The first float said, we demand an amendment to the Constitution of the United States enfranchising the women of the country. The word demand, the word demand was a problem because women were not supposed to use words like demand. That's a horrible word for a woman to use in 1913. Uh, nice women didn't use the word demand. Uh, they were putting an unsympathetic Wilson on notice that they expected action. Well, there was action in Washington that day. No sooner was Paul's parade underway when thousands of onlookers spilled onto its path blocking its progress. Many people spit at these women. They threw lighted cigarettes at these women. They hurled insults. And police? Where are the police? Police are there supposedly protecting everybody, right? Wrong. These police, derelict of duty, didn't do their duty. They let these women be assaulted. They turned the other way. And this, to the surprise of many, Paul was pleased by this chaos. The news uh, made news from coast to coast. This is a protest on May 9, 1914. On uh, March 19, the Senate voted against a proposed congressional amendment calling for the states to decide if women should vote nationally. The measure fell short of the required two-thirds vote of the Senate to pass uh, the proposal to the states. The uh, only time this ever happened before was in 1868, when the question of women voting came before Congress. New York City, that's a protest in New York City, and if you notice, all these women are all dressed in white. They're all dressed in white. Uh, activists leave Washington, D.C. to campaign against uh, Democratic congressional candidates in states where women were already franchised. On uh, October 23, 1914, an estimated 25,000 supporters in the women's Suffrage March, New York's Fifth Avenue, were led by Anna Shore, uh, Dr. Anna Shore, and Carrie Chapman Catt, the founder of the League of Women Voters. This guy's incredibly sexist speech on the floor of the House. His name is Congressman Stanley E. Bottle, uh, and he's from Ohio. On January 12, 1915, the U.S. House of Representatives reject a uh, proposal. Uh, to give women the right to vote. Uh, Anti-suffrage representative Stanley Bodle of Ohio gave an incredibly sexist speech on the floor. This is what he said. The women of this smart capital are beautiful. Their beauty is disturbing to business. Their feet are beautiful. Their ankles are beautiful. Probably has a foot fetish, what do you think? Uh, but I must pause for they're not interested in the state. That was read on the floor of the House of Representatives. Uh, the vote in 1915 was the second defeat for the suffrage amendment in less than a year. 
but the suffragette leaders uh, were pleased to have the issue discussed in Congress. They felt that progress was made. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic in Denmark, they're all dressed in white too, the women, right? That's the dress. You want the vote? The dress in women, in, uh, rather in white. And women in Denmark got the chance to vote in 1915. On June 15th, voting rights were granted to women in Denmark. Uh, the rights were also extended to women living in Iceland as well as the uh, island nation was still part of the Danish kingdom at the time. Uh, 1886, the Women's Progressive Association was created and began establishing a woman's voice on important Danish social issues. And by 1899, the Women's Suffrage Association was created with the sole purpose of establishing voting rights for women in Denmark. Come, come, time has come. Uh, in the early 1900s, uh, steps were made toward the uh, enfranchise of women in Denmark to various groups, so, or as various groups were allowed to vote in local elections. A new Danish constitution was passed which included full voting rights for women, as well as other reforms to the Danish government system. Literacy tests in immigration. And I am happy that my grandfathers and one grandmother went to synagogue every week because they had to read from the Torah. And reading from the Torah meant that they had some sort of literacy. And that was good to get into the United States. Uh, there was a growing backlash against newly arriving immigrants. Uh, the prevailing thought was that older immigrants were skilled, thrifty, hardworking, uh, like native-born Americans. Except the native-born Americans in those days were called Indians. There, were no, there was no such thing as a native-born American. Native Americans, people who lived here 10,000 years ago. Uh, anyway, uh, the recent immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe were unskilled, ignorant, predominantly Catholic or Jewish, and not easily assimilated into American culture. Something had to be done. America was becoming a dumping ground. Wilson says no to literacy tests. On January 28th, Wilson rejects an immigration bill. Uh, this is what he said. Uh, to the House of Representatives, it is with unaffected regret that I find myself constrained by clear conscience to return this bill, H.R. 660, uh, an act to regulate the immigration of aliens uh, to and the residents of aliens in the United States without my signature. Uh, the reason why Wilson uh, said no, it included a literacy test to get into the United States. If the people of this country have made up their minds to limit the number of immigrants and arbitrary tests and so reverse the policy of all generations of Americans that have gotten in before them, it is their right to do so. I am their servant, and I have no license to stand in their way, but I do not believe that they have. How many of you pick up a phone and say hello? 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 Pick up the phone and say hello, right? Well, uh, Alexander Graham Bell said, no, let's say ahoy, ahoy. That's what he wanted you to say. Anyway, the first transcontinental telephone call. A long distance telephone call was made possible by newly invented vacuum tube amplifier. Uh, and it was made on January 25th. Uh, Alexander Graham Bell was in New York City. He calls his old friend, Watson. Thomas Augustus Watson, he's in San Francisco. Uh, ahoy, ahoy. Um, Bell wanted everybody to say ahoy. Uh, that's how he uh, said hello to uh, Watson. Mr. Watson, are you there? Do you hear me? President Woodrow Wilson on the call to the White House uh, was on that call along with, as well as Theodore Vail, uh, who was the president of AT&T, and he was in Jekyll Island, Georgia. Federal League in Baseball started in 1914. Um, the Federal League came together in the early 1913 through the work of John T. Powers uh, and immediately challenged the operations of organized baseball or organized baseball as a league uh, outside of the national agreement. Um, after James A. Gilmore uh, succeeded Powers as league president, 
the league uh, declared itself to be Sorry, a major league. Sorry, we're going to lunch. Sorry, we're going to lunch. Playing in what detractors uh, called the Outlaw League allowed the players to avoid the restrictions of the organized league uh, reserve clause, which forced the player to be in the team in perpetuity unless the team ridded themselves of the player. The minor league Baltimore Orioles franchise was financially hurt by the Federal League's Baltimore Terrapins franchise and to sell off uh, a player to make ends meet. Orioles owner Jack Dunn sold the young Babe Ruth's contract uh, to the American League team, the Boston Red Sox, in 1914. In the Red Sox uniform, Babe Ruth hits his first home run May 6th against the New York Yankees. Now, the competition of another better playing league caused players' salaries to skyrocket, demonstrating the bargaining potential of free agency for the first time since the war between the American League and the National League ended in 1903 with the signing of the National Agreement. The league had eight teams in Baltimore, Brooklyn, Buffalo, Chicago, Indianapolis, Kansas City, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis. Brooklyn, Chicago, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis were competing against major league teams. Baseball's Federal League signed Falkenberg of the Brooklyn team. Uh, the new league was initially successful getting people to see games, but the financial strains of battling major league baseball teams and skyrocketing player salaries doomed the league to extinction after the 1915 season. Indianapolis had moved to Newark, New Jersey. After the league folded, seven of the eight clubs reached an accommodation with MLB in which, among other things, the Chicago Whales owners were allowed to buy the Chicago Cubs franchise and move them into Wigman Park, later renamed Wrigley Field, the St. Louis Terriers. Uh, ownership took over the St. Louis Browns business. The Federal League lasted two years, 1914-1915, be the last league that challenged the American and National Leagues in obtaining players. Of the 286 players to play in the Federal League in 1914-1915, 172 have major league experience according to the Society of American Baseball Research of those 71 would return to the American League and National League after the Federal League folded, but most major stars stayed in the American and National League. Baltimore Terrapins. By 1916, the owners of the Baltimore Terrapins refused to settle and instead sued the National League for various antitrust violations. Terrapins' ownership alleged that the buyout was in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Terrapin owners wanted to be admitted to the National or American League as a big league club, but major league owners didn't think Baltimore was a suitable market primarily because they thought the city was too small. The AL and NL owners also thought Baltimore had too large of a black population. Baseball had a color barrier, and the less colored players in Major League Baseball were employed in 1884, Moses Fleetwood Walker, the last one to play. The lawsuit would eventually have a significant impact on the baseball industry. Broadway. Uh, the Ziegfeld Follies, here the juggernaut that would transform the Broadway musical. When the uh, show was first mounted in 1907, no one, not even the producer Florence Ziegfeld, could have possibly imagined its impact. Ziegfeld was simply trying to mount a light, inexpensive entertainment for the summer season. The Follies in 1907 was such a big smash hit for Ziegfeld, put his own name on it, and began mounting it annually as the main event of the Broadway season. It also became a newsworthy event that was covered in gossip columns from coast to coast. Shows in vaudeville featured almost a dozen different artists, like the Ed Sullivan Show in play, or acts at the time performing all kinds of materials, songs, comedy routines, magic, acrobats, uh, acrobatics, uh, novelty acts, dramatic readings on what were called bills. The performers repeated their acts, which lasted about 10 minutes, at least twice a day, then moved on to the next town, or in big cities, the next theater. Broadway was an easier gig, and pulling performers from vaudeville was what Broadway was doing. The 1915 legacy. World War I ended on the battlefield November 11, 1918. Wilson and the Americans entered the war on August 6, 1917. Wilson attempted to negotiate a peace and started an international body called the League of Nations to prevent further wars. Uh, Americans never joined the League of Nations, signed off on two treaties to end the war. 
or they didn't sign off to um, the treaties of uh, Versailles in 1919 and the Treaty of Lausanne, 1923, which would end the war. D.W. Griffin's Birth of a Nation uh, is hailed as, uh, well, D.W. Griffin was hailed as Hollywood's first great artistic director. His pioneering filmmaking uh, spawned the new art form, feature film length, and um, the modern motion picture industry. 1992, the National Film uh, Preservation Board registers the birth of the nation on basis of its cultural, historic, and aesthetic importance. In 1999, the American Film uh, Institute ranks the film among the top 100 of the century. Both of these decisions and uh, related public showings of birth of the nation spur protests. In December 1999, the Directors Guild of America announces that D.W. Griffith would be retired as the namesake of its prestigious award for career achievements in movie making because he helped promote uh, what they call intolerable racial stereotypes. Although Guild members acknowledge his achievements, the vote to rename the award is unanimous. The Ku Klux Klan. Uh, the Klan would increase membership and would have a march on Washington in December. 1925. The KKK influence would begin to wane in 1925 after a jury found Indiana Grand Dragon David C. Stevenson guilty of rape and kidnapping uh, and second degree murder of a female aide. Donald Trump pardoning Jack Johnson. On March 24, 2018, United States President Donald Trump pardoned Jack Johnson convicted of violating the Mann Act in 1913 by taking his white girlfriend across state lines. Johnson surrendered to U.S. authorities in 1920. He served 10 months in prison. Johnson's story, the focus, in a Pulitzer Prize winning Broadway play, The Great White Hope, starring James Earl Jones in 1969. The 2006 book, Unforgiven, Unforgiven Blackness, The Rise and Fall of Jack Johnson was turned into a PBS special. Jess Willard parlayed his boxing fame into an acting career. He acted in vaudeville shows. Uh, he had a role in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show and starred in the 1919 feature film, The Challenge of Chance. In 1933, uh, he appeared in a bit part in the boxing movie, The Prize Fighter, and The Lady with Max Baer and Murder Boy. Uh, B'nai Brith News. Well, Anti-Defamation League starts because of Leo Frank. Uh, to help defend Leo Frank, B'nai Brith created the Anti-Defamation League in 1986. The Georgia Board the Pardon to the Burroughs finally granted Leo Frank a posthumous pardon. Not on the grounds that they thought of him being innocent uh, because his lynching deprived him of the right to further uh, the murder of Mary Fagan was a 1988 American two-part television miniseries starring Jack Lemmon. Uh, starring Jack Lemmon. Uh, the descendants of Mary Fagan's family and their supporters still insist on Frank's guilt. Emma Goldman. Uh, in 1916, Emma Goldman was arrested again for publicly speaking about birth control and did two weeks in jail. In 1917, Emma Goldman was arrested for violating the 1917 Espionage Act for speaking against the selective draft law. Uh, after two years in prison in Missouri, she was deported to Russia in 1919 along with several other uh, radicals, several hundred other radicals. Goldman lived and worked in Russia until 1921. When she left, she was disillusioned with the Russian Revolution. Exiled from the United States, and Goldman traveled through Europe delivering lectures as an advocate of anarchism and individual freedom. She spent uh, a little time living in Saint Tropez, France, where she wrote her memoir, uh, Living My Life in 1931, and in Toronto. She died there in 1940. She's buried in Chicago. Planned Parenthood. In 1916, uh, Margaret Sanger opened the first birth control clinic, the Brownsville Clinic in Brooklyn, and was arrested with New York City officials ordering the closing of the clinic. She served jail time in 1917. 1921, Margaret Sanger founded the American Birth Control League, which subsequently became Planned Parenthood, 
uh, Federation of America in 1923. She established the Birth Control Clinic Research Bureau. In 2021, Planned Parenthood denounced Margaret Sanger's belief in eugenics. Eugenics, a popular theory during the early part of the 20th century, was an ideology that labeled certain people unfit to have children. Votes for women. Uh, on September 30th, 1918, President Woodrow Wilson stood before the Senate to call for the passage of the 19th Amendment. On August 18th, 1920, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified. On November 2nd of that year, more than 8 million additional women across the United States were able to vote for the first time. Immigration restriction. Uh, 1916, an immigration bill that uh, Wilson vetoed was reintroduced, passed by Congress. In 1917, uh, there would be an Arctic Bard Zone uh, bill. Uh, that uh, barred people from uh, Eastern Asia and the Pacific Islands. Uh, uh, they couldn't immigrate to the U.S. It would be that 1916 immigration bill that was vetoed by Wilson that would come into being in 1917. Uh, Baltimore, uh, the Baltimore Terrapins, uh, their owner's lawsuit went through the courts in 1922. The Supreme Court of the United States ruled that baseball was a game and not an interstate business and gave baseball an antitrust exemption. Baseball could do anything business-wise. Babe Ruth was baseball's biggest star by 1919. Baltimore investors purchased the St. Louis Browns franchise after the 1953 season. The new Baltimore Orioles franchise began playing in 1954. Investors of a new baseball circuit, the Continental League, announced plans to become a third major league in 1959. The league never got off the ground. Uh, but that forced the National League to expand to Houston, meet the Mets. And those are the Marx Brothers in that picture. At the beginning of Vaudeville's demise, Broadway revenues, well, the beginning of, broad, of uh, Vaudeville's demise, uh, Broadway's view, uh, at the beginning of <laughs> Vaudeville's demise, Broadway reviews were becoming increasingly upscale after World War I and more competitive with one another. Variety Magazine added a category called Legit to distinguish these classier productions from the bond. One way for a review producer to rise above the crowd was to import, import a vaudeville superstar, like the Marx Brothers, uh, or even better and cheaper, to create a Broadway superstar from the ranking crowd. Radio would also pull vaudeville star stars away from the theater starting in 1920. Movies also took uh, away. Vaudeville was dead by the end of the 1930s. Any questions? Any comments? Your turn to talk on 1915.